All right, so pleasant good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we'll be looking at receptors and signaling, BNT cell receptors. Now, signaling, for us to fully appreciate the concept of signaling, is important to throw our minds back to AMP, anatomy and physiology. And when we think about anatomy and physiology, what comes to mind in terms of the words relating to them, it's structure and function. Structure is intimately intertwined with functioning. And this is true, particularly when you're looking at receptors and also the components of receptors, proteins. When you think about a protein, for instance, there are four states of the protein, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary relating to amino acid sequence, and then to the interrelated bonds which form between the uh, aggregation of those amino acids. So you go through from one, two, three, and four. So one of the things which is critical about to recognize when you're looking at receptors is this whole notion of structure and function. You change the structure of the receptor by changing sometimes, you know, the proteins associated with that receptor, and by extension, you change the function. And that is a key as it relates to signaling. When a receptor changes either structurally or by combination with another receptor, under the process of dimerization when two receptors come together, particularly in lipid rafts. So one of the things, if you're looking using electron microscopy at a cell and you want to investigate the whole process of cell signaling, one of the things you would look for when you do a fracture etching of the cell itself, you will want to look for lipid rafts present in the um, the membrane of the cell, the cell membrane. And when you look at these lipid rafts, they're in or located within them, you usually find receptors. So that is one of the hallmarks of receptors. They're usually located within re, um, lipid rafts on the cell membrane itself. So dimerization, just the aggregation of two receptors. And when they do come together, it initiates a cascade of reactions. So that's something important to think about or to remember as we go along. Something just as simple, two receptors coming together under certain circumstances, it leads to the initiation of a cascade of reaction. And there are a number of proteins which are associated with these membranes and the membrane bound proteins. There's a, uh, and they have been identified as having a domino type effect. So when you have, for instance, dimerization of receptors at the membrane, it could initiate a domino like effect, which, which usually involves phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. Two types of protein come to mind. You have the MAP kinases, which are associated with phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. And of course, G-coupled proteins in which guanidine is passed along. And this initiates a sequence of reactions, ultimately leading to the production of some, or the production of an end product because this sequence of uh, reactions initiated at the membrane goes through the cytoplasm. So you have associated proteins within a particular set. So for instance, you hear me mention like the RAS, the RAS, RAS. Um, so the RAS are a set of protein interrelated. So they have been identified by biologists in terms of these specific set of proteins, which are phosphorylated and dephosphorylated in a cascade type manner from the level of the membrane all the way down to transcription factors within the nucleus. And that's how you could have something binding at the level of the receptor causing an effect to occur within the cytoplasm through the transcription of the transcript, the DNA transcript, sorry, the RNA transcript within the cytoplasm. So keep that in mind as we go forward. So, in terms of the signaling, as just mentioned, this is a event that instructs a, a cell to change, right? So, when you think about it, it is very important for maintenance of homeostasis within an organism that you have that ability to communicate within and down to the level of the cells. From a very organizational standpoint, when we look at an organism, we have chemicals that make up the cell itself. 
The cells then arrange related cells to form tissues, tissues related to form organs, organs, organ systems of which the humans have 11. And then those organ systems collectively give the entire human being. So when we're thinking at the cellular level, that's why it's important to examine things at the cellular level, level because of the fact ultimately, because of that organization we have within the human body, it could affect us in totality, the entire human. So these signaling signals are usually generated by the binding of a ligand to a complementary bound cell bound receptor. So that interaction between ligand and the membrane, particular um, receptor located at the membrane, that is what initiates the reaction types. The cell could then become less or more susceptible to actions by increasing or decreasing expression of the receptor. You'd hear the term as cell microbiologists, you probably would have seen this with Dr. Setar, that when you have binding of certain ligands, what happens with the uh, receptors? They increase in number, and that process is known as, it begins with U. And they say they increase in number. You see, there's another term which is, which is very specific for cell, my, for cell biology. You see those receptors are, it rhymes with BUP regulated. All right, so we say you'll hear the term off and on periodically, you'd say that those, um, receptors, they are upregulated. So do take note of that, that term, upregulation of receptors, refers to when you have receptors, literally, that might be within the um, cell itself. They are now presented on the surface of the cell, such as they bind more ligand, or the signal that comes in due to the initial binding of ligand to one of the receptors could lead to transcription and translation of a particular DNA transcript, which could cause then the manufacture of proteins within the cytoplasm, which aggregate to form a receptor. And now the receptors, they actually present themselves at the membrane itself. So very important concept to note, binding of ligand with the receptor could lead to upregulation of receptors, i.e. the presentation of more receptors, which will then accept more ligand and which will then, of course, lead to more and more. So it's a, it's a positive feedback. This ligand may be a soluble molecule or it could be any, in terms of its class, classification. But do note, first on the list is peptides. So they're a sequence of amino acids usually form the first part. Of course, it could be sugars or lipids presented on the cell surface itself. This ligand may travel long distances from its entry point in the blood before it reaches a cell bearing the relevant receptors. So which is why, you know, when we think even of the endocrine system, which releases hormones within the body itself. The hormones are actually released throughout the bloodstream, within the bloodstream, and it travels within the body itself. But it's only when it comes to a, a recognition of a specific receptor, would you have activation and then the, the particular action to take place. So this binding, could cause changes in the receptor. And we mentioned some of these. You could have a conformational change. You could have dimerization present on lipid rafts. You could have locations, particular location in the, in the membrane where you have localized. So there are some areas where when you look at certain cell types, you would particularly find these receptors being present in more so than in other areas. And then of course you could have covalent modification. We'll speak to that when we look at the dynamics of ligand binding and just in within the next six slides. So when the alteration occur, it induces this cascade of events, which leads to activation of enzymes within a pathway. When we say pathway, again, we're relating it to interrelated uh, enzymes. So you have certain enzymes which are linked together or usually found together. So when you have this phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, set type of 
uh, instance is occurring when you have the activation of a receptor. Now what you have happening is that these related enzymes, they now become phosphorylated and dephosphorylated, passing on that uh, phosphate in essence all the way down to the level of the nucleus, causing DNA transcript, uh, trans DNA transcription, and then translation in the cytoplasm, leading to the production of a protein. So these signaling uh, results often induce a change in the transcriptional program of the target cell. We mentioned that because of this uh, cascade of reactions at the level of the DNA, you will have a specific areas which are then transcribed. Take note via the nuclear pore into the cytoplasm uh, on a, and then you have the translation into the protein. This could happen with multiple signals and all of these signals received by a cell, this occurs at the molecular level inside the recipient cell. So what are these ligands? We mentioned the binding at the level of the receptor. So what type of binding do we have? We have different types. One, you could have hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, of course, when you look at the oxygen, O2 minus, so this has a, a D minus charge, a negative charge. And when you're looking at hydrogen, you have now a interaction between the negative and positive because O is very electronegative. It pulls the majority of the electron towards it. So the H becomes positively charged and you have now this electrostatic interaction, which is known as hydrogen bonding. You have ionic bonding, which is even stronger. So here you have a, uh, the O minus ion and the NH3 plus, so you have a very strong bond. Hydrophobic interactions, when you do have, particularly with lipids and uh, water based li uh, ligand and receptors, you could have hydrophobic reactions or interactions occurring in the membrane, it's in the receptor. And when, when you have these conformational changes, this leads to activation of the receptor. So when we rem when you think of a receptor, it has two states the on and off state. The could move from the off to the on state, one, by binding of a ligand, or two, interaction with certain ligands, which cause a conformational change, leading it to move to the on state. Right, and this is also showing another one uh, in terms of an ionic bond between the acidic uh, end, C double bond O, o minus, and then you have the amine, amino uh, end here as well, positive negative interaction. This causes an ionic bond to be formed. One of the things to appreciate with this receptor ligand interaction when they are brought into close contact, you could now have interactions at different sites. So while the ligand itself, in terms of binding, it, the binding might only occur, let's say if you're looking at a protein of 500 amino acids, the particular binding sequence might be 30, 40 amino acids. But the thing is, when you do have that binding, it brings other areas of the, of the ligand into contact with the receptor. And that in and of itself, depending on the type of interactions, hydrogen bonding ionic or hydrophobic or weak van der Waal, which is temporary, um, dipole-dipole interactions, when this happens, this could then cause further interactions to occur along the length of the ligand itself. So these, and so these receptor ligands, you have antigen immune system receptor, which are enhanced by co-receptor binding. And co-receptors, they just enhance the normal binding capacity, which occurs between the ligand and the receptor itself, these co, these co receptors. So that's very important to take note of. Receptors, the expression could vary during the course of an immune response. And as shown here, for example, white blood cells, which are shown in this stain, this is um, a chemical stain here, treated with an activating mitogen, show upregulation of the receptors for cytokine IL-2. So the receptor here, right, is this one cytokine IL-2. When you compare from this one to this one, we see the upregulation or the presence of these receptors actually increase. So that is important to note in terms of upregulation. It's just a, you'll hear the term mentioned when in cell, in cell biology, but just means the increasing numbers of those receptors present. And that increase in number usually occurs because of the fact of that binding of ligand to the receptor. So here we are looking at local concentration of cytokines and other ligands may be, actually, may be, may be very high. 
and the cell may direct its secretion mechanism or machinery towards a recipient for a maximal effect. So this is just showing an example here, a dendritic cell. We mentioned dendritic cells. Um, they're usually found um, in mucus lined regions of the body, particularly in the mouth, uh, eyes, and also in the anal and, well, to less extent in the age, but the vaginal passage in particular. Here we see the cells secreted inside the kind IL-12, which is pink, to the T cells, which are green, no the localization of the cytokine filled vesicle rich area in the dendritic cell. So note the change. Here you're seeing then this very rich area within the dendritic cell. All right. So this binding, what does it do? Well, as we mentioned, it initiates it, this signaling cascade. And this signaling cascade could have different things associated with it. But primarily among them is this transcriptional programming as we, as we hinted towards in terms of at the level of the chromosome, at the level of the sequence of DNA, that being transcribed and ultimately converted into a protein. So do keep that in mind when you're looking at this binding uh, process. So this is given an example here, receptor and a ligand binding to the receptor. When you do have it, you have these receptor associated tyrosine kinases. Whenever you see the tyrosine kinases, when you, whenever you see the word kinase, always think about phosphorylation. So when the binding occurs, it becomes phosphorylated and they transfer their phosphate then to adapter proteins. So these adapter proteins then become by a sequence phosphorylated and dephosphorylated. So you have, so the whole cascade, it really involves the passage of a phosphate, a phosphate from point A to point B. But as the phosphate passes on, it triggers a sequence of proteins which have been identified in the cascade itself. And these proteins are then turned on and off as they are phosphorylated and dephosphorylated subsequently. So then here you have this uh, process occurring. And then you have the release of IP3. And then this causes a calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum, calcium release. Calcium then activates calmodulin and calcium urine. And this then leads to phosphorylation of N-fat. N-fat is then dephosphorylated, going back to its inactive form, but it passes its phos. Here's the inactive N-fat. It goes in, it's a transcription factor, and then it causes gene activation. So notice the phosphate then is released and it can now participate again in this cycle in a cyclical manner in terms of activation. Here's another pathway, the RAS pathway and the NF kappa B. So these these are three uh, the RAS and the NF kappa B, these are two of the more favored pathways relating to phosphorylation and dephosphorylation as it relates to signal transduction from the level of the membrane to the nucleus itself. All right, so this is there showing another, another way in which the signal could be activated. So we mentioned then binding, binding of, to a receptor directly. What you could also have is part of it could, could bind, as shown here, to an antibody, leading to dimerization. So then this causes the two antibodies to come together, and this now initiates a cascade of reactions. So dimerization, which is usually localized in lipid rafts on the cell membrane itself, this could, this could initiate um, receptor uh, signal, cell signaling as well. So some receptors, they require receptor associated molecules to signal, and they have short cytoplasmic portions. So some have short and some have long cytoplasmic um, areas which are exposed to the binding site of the uh, ligand. Tyrosine phosphorylation, this is an early step in many, in many of the signaling pathways, whereas the SARC family of kinase, SARC family of kinases, are related to phosphory, they phosphorylate tyrosines. So again, this whole process of phosphorylation as shown here, this sarcomology two protein, and then the phosphorylation, which simply means the passage of this phosphate. So shown here, this is the inactive form. And then of course, when it is dephosphorylated, the sarcomology two, the phosphate is passed on to the kinase, and now it's in the active form in terms of the receptor. This could now 
pass along that phosphate to a sequence of other enzymes causing um, in a domino-like effect, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, passing it on. And that is how the signal is transduced. All right, so in terms of the outcome, it could have uh, an activate an enzyme. It could induce interactions with other proteins, alter cellular location, protect the protein from destruction. And this is very important. When we think about HIV, for instance, you know, the one of the major things with HIV as it relates to the virus itself. It has that capacity to block the cell from actually signaling for the killer cells to come in, the NK cells to come and destroy it. So, you know, once the cell recognizes it is overwhelmed by viral infection, it does launch a signal and it does so by upregulating certain receptors. And what could happen, as is in the case with HIV, what they do is they block this cascade from happening such that the signal or the upregulation of those particular receptors on the membrane, which facilitate natural killer cell interaction, that does not occur. This is just uh, in terms of the adapter protein. This is just showing specific adapter proteins and the binding specificity of the adapter domain. So this is just so do take note of them. These usually come in terms of MCQs, right? The SARC homology two, as I mentioned before, SARC, SARC two and three, specific phosphatyrene contains motif in the context of these amino acids. And the SARC-3 homology, these are proline-rich protein, sorry, proline sequences in a left-handed helix prime. So the major one, SARC homology 2, 3. Uh, oh, it's our good friend tyrosine kinase binding, TKB, right? So this, these are probably the three most, SARC homology and the tyrosine, while the others are of note, but take particular attention to those three. All right. So we mentioned then how it could occur. We gave some examples. Now let's talk about some stages. So the adapter proteins, they help to gather members of the signaling pathways. We did mention that there are certain amino acids which are present. So this is where these adapter proteins come in. PIP2 may be phosphorylated by phosphatidyl and nistol 3 kinase or PIC3 kinase. And this creates a PIP as shown here, which can bind proteins with this specific domain. So the adapter proteins, as their name implies, this is the take home message. They help to gather members of the signaling pathways, right? So that is the take home with them. This is what, that is their major function. And in terms of how they do it, this is just an example shown here. You could have one, calmodulin for instance, it binds calcium ions. Secondly, the calmodulin, because of that binding of the calcium ions, you have a conformational change. And this conformational change now make it active. And calmodulin could now bind a target protein. So adapter proteins, they do help in this regard. And this calmodulins, they are a very important member of this group. So they bring the proteins together such that these particular reactions can now take a place. All right, so protein kinase C, PKC activation, this is another important one. So calmodulin adapter protein, but the PLC pathway, this induces calcium release and PKC activation. All right, so this diagram shown here, it shows the early and late events which occur when you have this function functionality occurring. So here, for instance, we see calmodulin in the inactive state, now becoming active, and an n fat protein is phosphorylated. When it is dephosphorylated, the n fat now is able to go in and facilitate transcription factor activation. So this is in the nucleus. It's very important to note this is in the cytoplasm. We're talking about in the nucleus in terms of the NFAT going through the, the nuclear pores and causing this act activation to occur. RASMAP kinase, this is another signaling pathway. It's a very important one. It's a G protein and it becomes active when it swaps a molecule, a GDP for a GDP. So guanine nucleotide exchange factors activate RAS by inducing by inducing this. So the, um, the factors, yeah, it is the G, GEFs, the guanine exchange factors, it facilitates that reaction to occur. You change between GDP and GTP, the inactive to the active state. So if you note ingoing um, 
from the inactive, from the active, from the, sorry, from the inactive to the active, this involves phosphorylation, All right? So it takes it up and now you could have it active in this regard. I didn't mention it, of course, explicitly, but the RAS proteins, they do participate in downstream signaling. So the RAS map kinase, it's a sequence of specific enzymes or proteins, which are follows this same domino like effect I mentioned, phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. And as this occurs, the signal is then passed on. So ultimately the RAS map kinase, it, this, the cascade or the domino effect, it activates transcription through this adapter protein one. So here it is at inactive to the active form. And then you have map, the phosphorylation of RAP, MEK and UK. So what is happening here? You're having the passage of the in sequence, they're phosphorylated, dephosphorylation, dephosphorylated. Ultimately, you have the activated ELK1 coming into the nucleus and leading to transcription. All right, so this is what I just explained there in terms of that passage. So another one, right, we mentioned the map kinase. So now we go into NF kappa B, nuclear factor kappa B. Right, so this is heterodimeric. So hetero meaning you have different sequence, two different parts making up the dimer, right? So it's not uh, homodimeric, which means it's com consisting of the same portions. So they're held inactive in the cytoplasm when they're bound with NF kappa B. Cell activation occurs when it when the process phosphorylates the inhibitor protein. So from the inactive to the active form, the cell activation, when it, once it activates, you have this phosphorylation of the inhibitor protein. So once the inhibitor protein is phosphorylated, you have now the activation. And this activation causes phosphorylation or ubiquination of the I kappa B and it targets it for destruction. So when we think about targeting for destruction, how do you think that targeting for destruction, what organelle would it involve in terms of destruction? Lysosomes. Yeah, so the, the lysosomes will indeed target them for destruction. So this, this last, this other one here, it's showing the structures of the antibodies in, uh, diagrammatically. So it's showing the particular domains and the directions in which they run. Right, so we're looking at the, and also the existence of the interactions here. So you're seeing a disulfide bond. Disulfide bonds are very important to lending stability to antibodies. So mentioned then activation of the cascade, mentioned some examples. We also mentioned the functionality of the adapter proteins in facilitating signal transduction as it relates to activation of MAP kinases and NF kappa B. Now let's talk about structure of some of these antibodies. So when we are thinking about um, the structures, they consist of two heavy and two light chains, which are held together by in inter chain disulfide covalent bonds. There's a very nice link which I found at the Merck drug site. And once we finish the lecture, I will post it up. I will, I'll put it in the chat so you can have a look at it. It's another angle to look at it as it relates to the structure of these antibodies. Now, the secreted, when you think about secreted antibodies, they are in and of themselves divided into five major classes. And they are shown here diagrammatically, DEG, D, G, E, the dimer, and of course the pentamer, in which you have associations via sulfide bonding into this particular structure shown here. So this is just showing the different classes, the heavy chain, number of domains, and the, and the type of uh, light chain which is involved with each class of the antibodies. So the domains of the antibodies in the heavy light chain extend the arms of the antibody away from the hinge region. So again, when we're looking, um, the arms of the body away from this hinge region. So you do have this particular sequence, which is outside of the, away from the hinge region. And the domains, 
two particular sites formed at the top of the Y in terms of the characteristic shape. And each antibody can bind two specific antigen molecules. So this is then showing the structures and no disulfides are very important or sulfur is, is important to the structure of the antibodies. Now, hmm, sulfur is important to the, in the formation of the bonds itself. And um, sulfur in terms of when we think of antibodies, sulfur has a particular um, effect when you're looking at a lot of the microorganisms in terms of a negative effect on both growth and replication, which is why for certain topical uh, creams and treatments, what do you use for, let's say, one of the more popular ones, LOTA? What is one uh, known treatment for LOTA? Well, anybody, when you have Must fungal, go in. Growth, <laughs> fungal growth, if, if, what do you used to use back in the day when you had LOTA? Or, you know, Must this fungal. go in, the little cream thing with little... Uh -huh. I think it's sulfur in it, Yeah, yeah, it is. Sulfur, uh, huh? sulfur in the yellow container. Yeah, yeah right. the yellow cover, yeah. Must go ointment. Yes, <laughs> oh, oh, must go. Yes, yes, yes. But way back in my day, I want to sound like a grandpa. But what you used to do, I care, you used to take a brill cream. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Do they still have brill cream? I don't, I don't think so. Where's brill cream? Okay, yeah, clearly. All right, you could just <laughs> Vaseline then. They still have Vaseline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 God. Uh, I bury do -do. Okay, so they take Vaseline very simply. And uh, do they sell sulfur powder in the pharmacy still? Yeah. Now everything is in. And all you do, just put the sulfur, the sulfur powder in the Vaseline, mix it up, dice it, and apply that. And you're good to go. As opposed to all of this must go thing. -ling -ling. Well, it's all, it's all a question of dosage, yeah? So always remember that. So one of the things with must go and so on, I am strongly guessing is that they have done those response to, you know, the existence of certain, um, certain fungal growths on the human skin. So they know particularly what is the optimal amount. So that's the only thing. But of course, back in the day was trial and error. If you put it on, I not seen. I mean, the dose is too low, so you put more sulfur in it. But that is what we used to do when I was but a wee kid. But it does, but sulfur, very good. When you're thinking about um, any fungal type treatment, sulfur is particularly good. So, so is sulfur good for um, athlete's foot? Mm, not particularly. Where, where's the best treatment for athlete's foot? Two things. I think we mentioned it already. And then me. Huh? Candid bee cream. Candid bee cream, okay. Some, what is something else that you could do not involving a cream in terms of athlete's foot to treat it? And it's bacon actually, soda? Pardon? Bacon soda? Bacon so, actually, yes, bacon soda is part of it. right? And, and most critically is to keep your foot dry and clean. And it might sound silly, right? But keep your foot dry and clean. You know, so, you know, like towel off your foot, wash your feet and keep it. But the key thing is keeping it dry. Keep your feet dry and the fungus will disappear. So that's where the baking soda comes in. That's where powder comes in, you know, in that regard. But some people I know, they, they have this issue in which their feet sweat, their feet and their, their palms sweat a lot. I don't know, anybody know anybody like that? In which, they, well, it's odd. You know, the feet and palm. How I knew when I was in college, my roommate actually, his feet would sweat a lot, right? So he, in fact, like during the course of a day, he had to change his socks like about two or three times, regardless of the temperature outside. You know, he had to change his socks because it, it's just a condition. I forgot the name of it, right? But in which the feet sweat a lot. So he was, he used to have to change it in order to prevent athletes foot from developing, right? So do remember that one of the major treatments is that very simply keeping your feet dry, dry feet, keeping them dry and applying um, baking soda or powder to, keep, to assist with the, keeping it dry. Some persons, however, this does not work for, and they would actually have to visit a dermatologist or a podiatrist in particular to get specific treatments for it, yeah? All right. And this happens as well when you have like communal bathrooms. So again, when I was in college, you know, we didn't have the luxury of a bathroom in each room. They'd have, well, I, I stayed in dorms. So, you know, at the end, at the end of the hall, 
was the bath. So you always have to go with your flip-flops, most critical, but you know, you could pick it up um, in the bathroom itself. So you always have to be careful uh, when you did go there and always remember to dry your feet. So that's how I, I particularly rem remember it from my college days. A little trip down memory lane, let's get back on track. The structure of antibodies, when we think about it, as I mentioned, you have the two heavy light chains, disulfide bond, Y con confirmation in terms of its structure. Now, each of the antibody domains have specific fun functions associated with it. The carbohydrate chains have these functions associated with it, right? They're generally very well glycosylated and some separated by oligosaccharide side chains that help spread the domains apart. So the carbohydrate chain is very important in terms of the structural representational. The heavy light chains, they also mediate certain specific functions. And as shown here, the membrane bound antibodies have three extra regions, right? So you have the primary transcript, which I have produced uh, in terms of uh, the primary transcript from the processed transcripts, and then Lias calls the ultimate secreted form. So from the primary transcript, right, this is at the level of the nucleus, when you have transcription factors activating, and now you have the primary transcript, this is brought out uh, into the cytoplasm when you have alternative splice into to, to get the process transcript. Now you have the rearrangement into the antibody structure, which is then uh, moved out to the um, membrane itself. So signal transduction, or if it's membrane bound or actually um, secreted all, all together. Now the signal transduction in B cells Right, so these are the ones that mature in the bone marrow. The antigen signaling, they proceed according to signaling strategies shared among many of the cell types. And again, when we're looking at the signaling strategies, right, when you do have um, the binding, what do you have happening? Uh, you have this, again, this cascade of reactions that occur, which could lead to gene activation and ultimately form uh, production of proteins. The receptors, the T cell receptors. So this is just showing a fragment of the receptor of the T cell. So we're looking at the Y arm. So this part here, right? In terms of the domains, they are not immunoglobulins, but they do have Ig domains and they belong to a superfamily of proteins. So one of the things when they have identified the T cells, look particularly at receptors associated with the T cell, they have found them that they're particular sequences. So therefore now they could classify them. Once you have homology among a specific set, now you could say, okay, these are specific characteristics as it relates to amino acid sequence. We found then that among this group, you have a particular sequence, as we mentioned last day, which is conserved. So it's always found among this group. And then again, you have a particular sequence which is concealed among another one. So that is how you could have classification, classification based on amino acid sequence conserved within the particular groups. So this is speak to um, the signaling. The receptors are heterodimers and they both, they possess both an alpha and a beta chain as we show in the alpha and the beta chain present on the molecule itself. And they're part of a complex that does include CD3 in terms of this particular protein. Now, a small subset of these T cells, they carry a gamma delta receptor instead. So not all of the, in terms of the classification, you do have this subset, which are very unique in terms of this gamma delta receptor. And when you look at the gamma delta receptor, then you'd find a unique sequence which characterizes it as a member of the set itself. So the co-receptors, we mentioned receptors, but you also have co-receptors which act alongside the receptors in terms of one bringing it in position such that you could have certain parts of the receptor now binding to an antigen, a specific antigen such that the interaction occurs. And then this of course leads to induction as it relates to signal transduction. So some of the co-receptors, the TD4, the T cell, sorry, co-receptors, the CD4 and CD8, and these are the two more important ones. So please take note of them, you know, write them down, the CD4, CD8. And this just speaks to the homology of the um, 
of these particular receptors, right? One is a 55 kilodalton monomer, and the other one is usually a heterodimer. So this is shown here, the CD4 and the CD8. Heterodimer consists of two different parts, the alpha and the beta hetero, uh, as opposed to a homodimer, in which you have the same portion existing. And this is just showing the different class. The major ones are these, uh, these two, the CD4, CD8, and the ligand, which they buy in the class two major histo histocompatibility complex, MHC, class one and two binding to these two receptors. These are the more important of the lot. And what are their functionalities? One, for adhesion. So you have then cell-cell adhesion. You also have signal transduction, and they're also a member of the Ig superfamily. So these are, do take note of these two, the CD4 and CD8, they're the more important of the lot. So when we speak of um, the receptors, LCK, this is the first tyrosine kinase, which is activated when you're looking at the T cell signaling. You have, do have differences. So in terms of here, you're seeing the CD4 receptor. And the first one to be activated is the LCK. So this is the one that they are speaking of. And then, of course, you have signal conjunction via phosphorylation, dephosphorylation. So it's phosphorylated, dephosphorylation, phosphorylated, dephosphorylation, passage of this phosphate along a sequence of amino, sorry, a sequence of enzymes, which ultimately leads to um, gene activation. This could take place through different pathways, the NFAT, NF-kappa B, and the AP1 uh, sequence of enzymes, which leads to the activation. So this whole notion then of signal transduction, it's a very complex subject, but ultimately it refers to the binding of a ligand of a protein at the level of the receptor and the passage of that signal from the level of the receptor to the level of the nucleus, ultimately re, um, giving rise to a protein, which is translated inside of the cytoplasm, of course, on a ribosome. The trick is to look for similarities. So both the B and T lymphocytes use similar strategies. And when you understand the antigen receptors, understand the cascade of reactions which occur, understand which pathway, not only understand, but to identify the pathway by which this reaction occurs, by which the steps of the reaction occur, then it is very, that is how you could classify, you know, the particular receptors. Some of them are classified also based on the pathway in which is utilized. All right. And that is where we end our lecture for today.